Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. LR and Benji here. This show is always presented by Zwift, the online cycling platform that makes training fun. We have one of these podcasts a year, the big Tour de France wrap up. That's the men's Tour de France and the Tour de France fan Mavic Zwift all in one podcast. We've got some, we're doing a little bit, little bit differently. Of course, we'll have the rapid fire stage review as well as I'll speak a little bit more about the Yumbo Visma consultancy at the start of this podcast. But we'll get into a lot of topical stuff like, was this the best Tour de France ever or the best one we've watched? We are but 12 years old. How Wout Van Aert won the green jersey? Will the competition change next year? How did Jonas Vingegaard pull off the upset in the Tour de France? Who was the best actual sprinter? We'll talk about KOM again. I think that's Benji and I's like, favorite topic is complaining about KOM points distribution. And then we'll review Ineos and UAE and Pagatch's Tour de France as well, what they could have done differently, what we expect them to do differently next year as well. There'll be a little bit more of a forward-focused Uh, look in this podcast but before we get into that the racing the month of racing concluded yesterday thanks to everyone that checked out our Twitter France fam of X Swift content on the podcast or on the Latin Rouge YouTube channel but the finish line is just the beginning for those riders congrats to Annemiek van Vleuten for taking out the yellow jersey as well as supporting LRCP Zwift is supporting the Twitter France fam for another three years so as I said Thanks to everyone for tuning in, not just to our content, but particularly to the the race live or reading about the race or consuming the race in any fashion because that shows demand for the sport and that's how the sport can grow and the race can keep growing and get bigger and better in years to come. So if you'd like to support Zwift and give easy, accessible indoor riding a go, head to Zwift.com for your free seven-day trial. But before we get into that, here's a little extra word I had on the Yumbo Visma consultancy. So as I said, I'd like to provide some more information about our consultancy work, address some concerns you may have had, as well as how we plan on working in the future. But thanks to so many of you that reached out with supportive comments, uh, really, really appreciate it. And the feedback, we've discussed it and we've taken it on board. So just to give some clear information about that consultancy work with Yumbo Visma, I'd reiterate, we had an objectivity clause in the contract that re- gave us the right or we retain the right to say whatever we like on the podcast or elsewhere and Jumbo Visma never had any input into anything said on the podcast or other content the agreement which in this case it was solely Benji and I who work with Jumbo Visma was to provide them with video analysis data and strategy advice so the product or service whatever you want to call it to consulting teams is distinct or different from the podcast Lantern Marouche YouTube channel or other media stuff so I believe, and still do, that working with teams will make the podcast and the videos better. It gives us unique insight into how the teams operate, which should ultimately improve our knowledge base and the quality of the content in the long term. And also, it already has in the short to medium term. But I can understand and appreciate that some of you felt disappointed at not having been informed earlier of this arrangement. And I don't take it for granted that many of you listen to us almost maybe every day and that the podcast or the highlight videos or other stuff, they're an essential companion to your enjoyment of cycling. And so with that being said and your feedback taken on board, I'd like to outline a few points on how consultancy will be dealt with moving forward if Benji or I choose to continue doing such work. So firstly, in all future consultancy work, I or we will disclose the existence of the arrangement publicly at the time we enter the agreement and also uh, I'll disclose when such agreements have come to an end. And secondly, this is already the case, but any consultancy contract will always contain an objectivity clause so that the work doesn't constrain our ability to provide objective race analysis or do what we do on the podcast or elsewhere. And thirdly, and this is again already the case, but all data or process data that has been used or will be used in the consultancy consultancy agreements is derived from publicly available sources, except obviously where the relevant client team provides us with the data. Um, So hopefully this answers any questions you may have had or alleviates some concerns. We appreciate all the feedback we've received on it. And yeah, I'd like to say thank you to the EU for helping grow this podcast to be so big. And whilst uh, it has grown really fast, as well as the Lantern Rouge YouTube channel. It still is the work of a very few individuals who work hard rather than being like a large media corporation. But 
we will keep trying to produce the most entertaining and unique content on Pro Cycling, and we hope that you will continue to enjoy it along with us. And so now we'll get into the Tour de France recap. But now that the dust has settled, Benji, on the Tour de France month, where do you think my charger is for my camera? There were some good answers <laughs> yesterday. Where do you think it is? I actually don't know. I, I honestly don't have a clue. I think it can be found with the the great uh, the great schedule of Aramburu during the season in existence because um, he didn't have that. <laughs> oh, no, he did races. Well, he, he did, did. races. <laughs> <laughs> Not the great ones. <laughs> this guy can't catch a break. It's a Tour de France recap. He didn't even do the race. Or did he? He didn't. Did he? he didn't. He didn't. <laughs> he was supposed <laughs> he just, to. He was just supposed getting roasted. To. Really? He was supposed to do the Tour de France and he was taken out to take UCI points in different races. There weren't <laughs> any races during the Tour de France. There's the Basque race yesterday, which he could have done anyway. It's Aww. just pointless. I'm um, sad. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the actual answer, wrong answer zone is from Moose Sheep, who said the the battery charger was labeled Patrick and Patrick Lefebvre stole it, thinking it was his in Paris. And so yep. it's somewhere in a um quick step alpha vinyl livery BMW in the ether in the back seat. That's the actual answer. Anyway, rapid fire recap, you know how we do it. And you'll probably have forgotten all these stages. Stage one, the TT, wet conditions, huge upset. Yves Lampart wins the TT, Laporte crashes, Lampart takes the yellow jersey. He keeps it for just a singular day because on stage two, Jakobsen does the business back-to-back. Quick step wins, wins the first sprint in Nyborg. The, uh, the bridge was a bit of a flop, but Van Aert comes second, overperforms in the sprint and takes the yellow jersey on bonus second stage three. Another sprint, Groenewegen wins it, back-to-back Dutch only Dutch speakers won the first four stages, mental. Uh, Van Aert still in the jersey. Transition day. Van Aert wins the Calais stage, attacking on that hill. Doesn't wait for Vingegaard, but yeah, Paranis repeat, and it looks like Jumbo, uh, the stronger, maybe the strongest team in the race. Simon Clark wins from the break in the Paris Roubaix stage. Pagacha takes 13 seconds and looks impeccable. Roglic crashes, Hay crashes out. And Jonas and the other TC contenders just sort of survive. Uh, stage six to Long Wheat, Pagacha wins. Bonus seconds, takes yellow. Stage seven, Planche de Belfi, Pagacha wins. Bonus seconds, but he can't get Vingegaard who attacks him. Stage eight to Lausanne, Van Aert wins. Pagacha third, four bonus seconds. Stage nine, he's now got like a 30, 40 second lead. Uh, on Vingegaard and Roglic is looking okay on Super Planche but not so okay on maybe stage nine where Jungles wins despite UAE pacing hard all day they can't catch the break it's a little bit curious uh then stage 10 the same sort of thing happens they should we should we not is what Pagacha said in the interview afterwards. Court wins, beats Schultz in the bike throw in the break stage from Mijev. Pagacha keeps the jersey. Kamina doesn't win it by 11 seconds. Then the Grenoble stage. The sort of This will be a historic stage where Jumbo rolled attacks after Telegraph with Rolich and Vingegaard. Vingegaard wins, puts nearly three minutes into Pagacha, takes a 2.20 lead and the yellow jersey, which he wouldn't relinquish. Peacock wins on Alpe d'Huez. Uh, with Froome. That was a great stage, actually. Pedersen wins in Saint-Étienne. Matthews wins to Mons, beating Bettiol. Philipson wins his first TDF stage in stage 15, the 40-degree stage to Carcassonne. Hugo Hull wins in Foix, and there's a GC stalemate. Pagacha wins on Perregoud, where McNulty and Björg, despite uh, Micah being out, they were able to light up the race. Stage 18 to Altecam. Vingegaard wins with Pagacha trying on the descent and Spandels. Laporte wins the Finesse attack on stage 19. Van Aert wins the TT to Rock Mador. And then Philipson wins the, parent, uh, the final celebration stage with Jonas Vingegaard winning GC by... Uh, 243, Thomas in third on 722, Van Aert points, Vingegaard KOM, Pagacha Youth, Ineos teams. That was the rapid fire, Benji. Which stage did you forget happened? Barely any for me. Ooh, did I forget happened? I think uh, I'd have to point perhaps at the Bob Jungel stage is the one that is not memorable yes. for me. Yes. Despite the history when it comes to Ugo Ul and the great story behind it. I'm afraid that that's one that I'll probably forget relatively soon personally. But outside of that, is it weird to say that Adam Berg is one of the more forgettable stages in this tour? I agree. I agree. <laughs> like, well, I'm not 
Because it kind of, uh, yeah, maybe just because in the first week, but I kind of agree, like there weren't too many attacks um, at that sort of stage. I think the Mejev stage was actually pretty memorable because I kept thinking like, why were UAE pacing? Um, but let's talk about, I want to start with Pogaccia first. Let's talk about not how did Pagacha lose this TDF. He didn't. He tried to win his best. What do you think? I'll give my opinion first on a few things, which probably haven't been mentioned enough before, and it starts before the Tour de France, and that's team construction. I think Tadej Pogaccia, Benji probably agrees. I would be surprised if he didn't. Tadej Pogaccia is the best rider in the world, best yeah. GC rider in the world. In all conditions, he's the best rider in the world. And when you have the best GC rider in the world, and a very big budget, it, you are expected to win the Tour de France. And uh, a few things happened. Trent and COVID, they can't control that. I think I said the UAE team isn't as strong, and so they will, that will cost them in the first week because Yumbo will take advantage. And I was r- sort of wrong and sort of right. It did cost them because if you have a Stefan Kuhn-level guy, if you have a Matteo Trenton-level guy on your team, you're taking more than 13 seconds on stage five. So yep. the team wasn't strong enough to exploit Pagacha's biggest strengths, which is that he is a top five classics rider in the world. That's the problem. Uh, like, I think, what does he take with those? And I, again, training got COVID, they can't control it. But the, you know, Langan's the replacement. They don't have the depth because they don't have the big budget. Like, how much time could he have taken on stage five if, if they went in with, in with an attack mindset rather than a let's not lose the tour mindset? I think it's a significant amount. And it comes to the question I put on Twitter the other day. Let's say my question on Twitter was, what would happen in this Grand Tour if Pogacar was the leader of Ineos? And people were saying, oh, no difference, no difference. But I fought back and I agree with stage five. Because if on stage five, Van Barle is on the team of Pogacar, oh, yeah. <laughs> he takes more than a minute, a minute and a half on Vingega, who has that puncture and then has that Beautiful panic in one picture moment with five riders by the side of the road by Yambo. Still the funniest moment of this entire Tour de France, by the way. That special frame right there. But if he's at Ineos, for example, Pogacar, he has that support on the cobbles. He's got extra strength there and he can gain significant time on that stage. So I think that's the vital difference here when it comes to uh, the strength of his team. And also next to that, if he had a stronger team, well, on one end you can say throughout the Grand Tour, UAE's team has been struck by a lot of bad luck, illness, uh, riders that got injured riding up a climb like Micah, for example. That's something that like that happens and you can't do anything Bennett about COVID. that. Exactly, Bennett COVID, stuff like that. Now, they get to the final week. Let's say they'll still have five or six riders and it's an Almeida in there. It's uh, stronger climbers. Then they can counter the satellite riders of a Yumbo team more. And well, because they were Almeida. Limited, that's true. I, I I slightly disagree, or okay. man, I cut you off so you didn't get to finish your point. But <laughs> the problem is the UAE climbing squad is really good. McNulty, Micah, Bennett got COVID, but shout out to Bennett. Um, check out his podcast. We always like George Bennett. He actually looked good on uh, Morgan Stage 9. I thought he was coming into some good shape. He did a long pull and... He got COVID. I thought in mountains, they were covered. Soler, medium mountains, Soler was good. Yeah. The problem, and I still think they should have taken Almeida. I still, like, I can't believe they didn't. But the problem was break formation and the, the cobbled stage. Basically, the team wasn't strong enough to stop Yumbo Visma taking the piss. Like, Yumbo Visma's like, we're going to get two riders in the break and we're going to get Wout well in the break and there's nothing you can do about it. And yep. it's not Mark Hirschi's fault. Trenton got COVID. Hirschi, I think, had his own health issues. He's like, I can't believe the guy got through the tour. So, yeah. like, chapeau to him for getting through the tour. But, like, it's not his fault. But also, he couldn't contribute. Like, he can't control the break of Laporte, Van Hoydonk, Wow, and, and Benoit. So, the problem is the flat rulers where they're, they're missing a Betiol, a Kung. They miss Trenton. They just didn't have that to stop Yumbo getting riders up the road. Or making it more difficult, um, and and you're you're saying Benji, they could have had riders go with those Yumbo guys. I, I think denial would have been better. I, I, I think agree because de- denial would have been better. I completely agree with you. I was perhaps thinking a Formula could go up the road and so forth, but I agree. It's 
it's not as simple as that. It's much easier to deny those riders to be in the break in the first place than to put a rider in there because you don't know how good your satellite rider is going to be compared to the others, for example. But I fully agree with your points on on this case. And I think you are spotted well the two issues that UE had in the uh, in the all-encompassing Grand Tour that was the Tour de France, which is the brake formation control and also unable to take the opportunities where Pogacar is stronger than their competition, which is on the cobbles, for example. And so I've been consuming a bit of Italian press and Spanish press. So we, we've done week one. We both think with a different team and, and approach, Pogacar can take big time. In, yep. in those sort of stages. And and maybe then he doesn't need to have the team pace and spend a lot of energy on 9 and 10. We get to stage 11, though, for Pagaccia. And I think, sorry if I'm misquoting, but I think Machin or Gianetti, I think, uh, said before the stage, the plan, their plan was not to react on Roglic. Um, but maybe they didn't expect him to go as early. I think... I think this tour would have been a lot closer, a lot closer if Pogaccia doesn't react on Roglic. Now, is that hindsight, Benji, like where how can you not react to Roglic when it's Primoz Roglic? How can you not yeah. react to him? I would say, I would argue there were a few indications publicly facing from Morgin and Mergev where he didn't look as good um, or wasn't sprinting. Maybe he could have been bluffing. But what do you think? Is it, can... Should Pagatcha have reacted to the Roglic Vingard like eight, one, two, one, two, one, twos? Well, for the entertainment level of his viewers, it was amazing. Like, generally, one of the best moments of this Grand Tour is the, the one, two attacks that followed. Should he have attacked uh, or at least followed the attacks of Roglic on the Telegraph already? That's where I'm like, that's early. Um, they've got Laporte in the break in that stage, they've got Van Aert in the break in that stage. I think it's still risky to have Roglic up the road, but. I don't think it's as risky as spending all your energy trying to follow at that point in the race. You can use your team to try and keep the gap as close as possible and keep the energy for the latter part of the stage without having to go all out already. But the issue is, if Roglic is up the road, you get a similar effect. You get your team working until you have to work yourself. And when that occurs, then uh, you're bringing on up. Just his team? Or other teams could indeed come in the third top three riders for example could start mingling them but i think they would have uh they would have forced ue to eat their plate out first i would dare to say but i want to i want to add something else like i think the bigger mistake in that stage was on the actual galibier climb so yes. they do those yes. one two attacks and i still don't really get why pogachar kept riding to the top of the galibier because let's say he drops Jonas there well for not still ahead he's just gonna drop to vingaga and he's it going to try to and bring Vingo up, Brack. Tell me. It was, I think he was very concerned about Van Aert being ahead. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It makes, Roglic was dropped on Galibier. And I agree, it is difficult to fully criticize in the moment after Telegraph. If you do map it out mathematically with Roglic three minutes back, assuming some help from other teams, Roglic would have had to do a 50-minute climb solo, descent with Wout, and yeah. then a 40-minute climb solo and take back three minutes, and then he's still level with you. I don't think he should have reacted. Um, but as, yes, Kreuzweig was pacing, steady pace. Roglic was dropped, and Pegatcha attacked on Glibier. And I think that was to stop Jonas attacking to bridge across to Van Aert at that point. That was why he did it. Um, but... Like, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. And then I agree, it, it didn't. And didn't he even, did he attack again? Like Bardet and Thomas came back and then he accelerated again. Or he re even reacted on Bardet. Bardet attacked and he like brought him back on top, yeah. of, top of Olivia. And listen, when I was watching it at the time, I was like, holy shit, this guy's unstoppable. Like he must feel <laughs> so good. And I think he must have felt really good. But it obviously was a mistake. And then on Grenoble, I also would say, um, Raphael Micah was really, really strong on Grenoble. Maybe like we estimated like six watts per kilo, 5.95 for close to 20 minutes. That's really hard pace. And it almost seemed like, I don't know, he didn't, that was too hard, Benji. He dropped mm -hmm. all the, he dropped Coos immediately. He dropped Kreisvike immediately. Like yep. why did he pace so hard? They, surely Pagatcha would have said, I don't feel it. Or maybe he didn't know. 
I don't know, was there a communication issue? Was it just suddenly that Pogaccia was like, okay, I'm running M2 suddenly? Like, there's always that possibility. We don't True, know that factor. you get factor. to 2,000. Yeah, possibly. We, we're not in that team car. We don't know about that factor. But it was seriously a decent pace because he basically brought Pogacar to a moment where he could not even respond to Vingegaard's move that actually happened. He instantly capitulated the second that Vingegaard made his move while Micah tried to up the pace to try and close it. And that's what opened up the gap between Micah and, and Pogacar there. Like... Do you think there's a different scenario where where Pogacar drops earlier off the wheel of Vingigo and keeps his own tempo with Mike and loses less time? I don't know. I don't know. I, I do wonder. I've been thinking about it a lot. The wow going back for Roglic thing, where it looks mm-hmm. like the way it played out was really preferable for Jumbo Visma because you go back, you collect a UA domestique who's the only guy strong enough, stronger yeah. than Coos and Kreisweich, to set that pace. And it almost cracks Pagacha, the Micah pace. But then I was thinking, okay, what if Wout had just kept hard pacing the group? As you say, Pagacha has less time to feed, much less time to feed and recover and get restore glycogen and hydration. And then Jonas might have been forced to attack earlier. And maybe he takes even more time. It's That's what I've been thinking about. Impossible to know, but I... I think it was the Galibier. I, I think I, I don't think the Grenon pace. Like yeah, I think it was the Galibier. I, I don't think Pagacho could have done too much differently once they got to Grenon. But at least Godu got saved at that stage. At least the Wout van Aert thing that, saved Godu. <laughs> how many GC places did that save? <laughs> like three? <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> it's bloody yeah, great though and, i love it <laughs> and on pagur on, and on stage 17 when everyone stopped <laughs> he got to come back in poor quintana <laughs> on the days he was good at, well yeah i know um but that was okay so that was stage 11 pagach is now 220 behind at that point really i have no idea what ua could do differently i, th- I think they did the best they could and pagach did the best they could he put on a show yeah. and he attacked when he could like when he said i could you know if I attack on Pagur and Wout is ahead, it's pointless. Yeah, yep. it's pointless. Like, that's the problem. And with the little resources uh, team they had, they did, you know, it was fine. And he he nearly won the tour. Like, Tari Pagacha nearly won the tour on stage 18. Let's not forget, he nearly won. Like, he was a split yep. second, two millimeters of tire contact away from winning the Tour de France. And that's why, you, you know, you always should keep trying, even on descents, even when you're not even the best descender, when you've got nothing to lose. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't work out. But what do you think What do you think the changes will be? Like, I still think, I don't think Jonas Vingegaard, let's assume next year, Benji, we don't have Grenon sort of stage. It's a more normal Tour de France parkour. I think Pagacha will be favorite. And let's assume that, you know, we have a, a couple of rainy days and it's not 40 degrees. That's also people don't realize it, the heat, it was extremely hot. All tour made a big difference, I think. What do you, what changes do you think they will make? What what do you think they need in the team? And what approach do you think Pagacha should have for a normal tour parkour? Well, let's first figure out the team and so forth. So we know that UE's got youngsters in their in their town. They've got Ayuso, for example. I think that Ayuso was not meant to be riding the Vuelta in 2022. It's not announced yet whether he will. Uh, if he does that, then he might actually show up at the Tour de France next year. But if he doesn't ride any Grand Tour this year, then it's Vuelta time next year is my guess for Ayuso. So I would argue that it is unlikely at the moment that we'll see Ayuso in that Tour de France team next to Pogacar. I think Almeida is the likely one I do see next to the team, uh, next to Pogacar at the Tour de France next year. And... Is that going to change a lot? I think it's a better climber. I hope they, I hope they, they strengthen themselves when it comes to the flat ruler type riders, like you mentioned, the ones they need to control breakaways and to do cobble stages, for example. Although there likely won't be a cobble stage in a year after another cobble stage. Nah. It's my guess with the Tour But a rider like a Steven and so forth are the ones I'm, I'm looking at. I'm not even sure he's out of contract at this point, but just naming a rider. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Just a rider like Kung. that. Kung. Kung. Yeah, he's there's been whispers about trying to break the contract at FTJ. He has a clause apparently. UAE 2023, according to PCS, they only have 13 riders on the contract. Climbing and medium mountain, they're good. Bennett, Almeida, 
he or she that's not un- unwell or underprepared, Soler, McNulty, they're good. Micah, I assume they will assume they will extend. I think going back to stage eleven, by the way, sorry, Soler, I believe I don't. There was a UAE rider who nearly made it across the Laporte group again. Soler. If if Soler makes that group, maybe Pagacci wins the Tour de France. Like, yep. and I don't know what happened because he was in front of Thomas. I don't know what happened. It didn't show it, but it's fine margins and the best support possible is important. But yeah, Kung, those sort of style riders, really, really important for Pagacha. Finn Fisher Black is a good prospect, but he, I don't think he's he's 20. He had a bad crash this year. I'm not sure he's ready to step up to be that guy uh, next year. I think Bjerg... I'm not sure he has the the touch for it, Benji, for break mm. formation. I, I know he's young; he's like 23, so I, it's in, it's in unfair to compare him to to Row. But like I, I watched a lot, and he, he's chasing breaks he doesn't need to, and that puts him under pressure. Then when the ones he needs to mark, like they just they just sort of snap closing everything, everything, yeah. and, and that really puts him under a lot of pressure. Alperson also did that a little bit too. Uh, they're not. They don't quite have like the finesse of a de clerk. Like anyway, but that, that's. Is there any other name you want to throw in the hat for them that you think they should they should go after? Honestly, I, I'd have to take a look at the transfer market. So for now, I'll, I'll keep it down. I'll keep it closed. We'll talk about transfers when they happen in our roundup uh, podcast Benji's coming up. Probably uh, rapid rider. No, 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 no. Aramburu. Yeah. Well, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sad state if that happens <laughs> imagine you represented aaron brew and you come on a podcast where the co-host just roasts you around. you have to just sit there <laughs> you'd be like can you Crying. not do that podcast anymore <laughs> anyway that was uae and pagatcha's tour de france he won we well, went three stages came second and i mean it wasn't a result he wanted but yeah i think a lot of learnings for next year uh i don't want to go to Let's, let's change from GC. Wavenart Green, Benji, he walked it like we said because I didn't expect him to come second in back-to-back pure sprint stages. I think Christoph Laporte could be the best last man in cycling right now because Jonas Rickart's still still out. Um, the laporte Wavenart combo was so good. Do you think, say next year, let's talk next year again, like you know how he won it easily, like it was TTs, cobbles, whatever. It, it was He walked it. A normal one, 2021 style green jersey. I think Philipson can beat him. I think so as well, actually. But it also depends on the support that Philipson has because we will talk about the sprinters a bit later. But I'm saying it again if Ricard is here, then Philipson wins three or four stages instead of the two that he has. And yep. as a consequence, if that occurs in a 2021 style Tour de France with more flat, pure sprints, the like the ones Cavendish takes last year then it's more likely that a philipson gets more points all across a grand tour philipson would definitely get closer but i think wout finard ah he's he's favored regardless i think like even last year if he all out goes for it i think he he comes very close to i think he beats cavendish last year if he completely goes for it and has the freedom that he had this year to go for it yeah, you're probably right. And even this Tour de France, actually a lot of the intermediates, whilst there weren't many sprint stages, a lot of the intermediates weren't after a decent climb. So it yep. didn't really suit the the guys like Wout van Aert. But yeah, he won. He walked it um, and won two or three stages as well. So, but yeah, I agree with Benji. Oh, sorry. I, think, uh, I think I want to mention, like, it is also very clear that it helped a lot for Wout that he initially took a lot of points in the first week already like you mentioned those those two sec- three second places in a row and then getting the victory on stage four that's a, a significant boost of points compared to waters he can take time trial points that sprinters gone he can take hilly stage points on that stage four that a pure sprinter like Jakobsen can't for example and that's where significant gaps are made initially that is a mental barrier for other riders to still go for the green jersey for example a pure sprinter after week one might say, okay, this Wout van Aert guy is so far ahead. I'm going to aim for stage wins. I'm going to skip the sprint in the middle of the stage when it comes to the intermediate. Just going to sprint at the end, hoping that I've put all my eggs in the basket of the stage win here. And if you compare Philipson that... Philipsen did that. 
Exactly, but he also did yeah, odd weird. stuff when it comes to intermediate sprints. So I, I can't actually place that. Like when it comes to Philipson, he didn't go for intermediate sprints in week one already. Then we've got Baderson being one of the riders that I would have expected to be decent for the green jersey. In the end, in hindsight, I'd say that he wasn't consistently good enough to compete for the green jersey. But if he started for the intermediate sprints initially, he would have gotten a significant amount of points towards the end. Magnus Court Nielsen the break the initial week. If he actually like goes for full points there and even sprints for a top 10, top 15 position every sprint, I think he can get top 10s in sprints, Magnus Court. Personally, I think so. Meh. Meh. Okay. I, I think <laughs> Magnus Court could have gotten third or, or something in the green jersey classification this year if he finished the race, first of all. That's a pretty important factor. Yeah. And uh, next to that, if he consistently scored points throughout the three weeks, which he did in the first week. Yeah, I agree. And like he won on Mejev. Like Mejev had 30 points, which is uh, more than that's third in a pure bunch sprint. So that's a whole host of points because of his versatility. But yeah, I think if it's a little bit more balanced next year, like it was, this was the one where it just couldn't lose. I yep. think he nearly or broke Sagan's record. Uh, but even if it is balanced, as Benji said, a Cavendish one style last year, a style last year, I, I think Wout should still be the favorite for it if he's got the freedom to go for it. Um, Philipson. He was the best sprinter at the Tour de France. We already mentioned that. I, th- I agree with Benji that he would have one more stage with Ricard here. Let's talk about Jonas Vingegaard. How did Vingegaard win the Tour de France 2022? I think surviving the first week, that the first nine stages, it could have been a lot worse on the cobbled stage. And then, yeah, just going crazy on that Grenoble stage. And then just being equal or better pure climber than the Gatcha in the... In the third week, I think his, his TT was really good. Do you think, I don't know, like what does this mean for next year, Benji? Like head-to-head, there's been whispers. We don't know anything about it. There's been whispers about uh, Roglic to Ineos, but that's been denied. But, for example, let put that to a side, but if you're Yumbo, do you go, okay, Jonas, he was a better climber. He was a better TT rider in the final TT. We can send Rolich to the Giro Vuelta and try and win all the Grand Tours. Or do you think, no, 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 what worked was the dual leader, one, two, one, two. Let's roll that back. I think it would be pure arrogance not to send Roglic next to Jonas to, uh, to, the, to the Tour de France next year. And we look at the Tour de France, we see that Roglic is such, such a big factor in that initial week, both mentally and physically mentally on the competition on Pogacar because he needs to always look for Roglic as well next to following Vingegaard. And then on stage 11, for example, it's significant physical impact that Roglic has on Pogacar on the initial half of the stage, for example. So I think Roglic in this ground tour matters a lot when it comes to Jonas Vingegaard. And the question then is, is it also the opposite? Let's say that Roglic is not at this race, and Vingegaard has full support on the cobble stage. Does he completely come back to the group? That's also a question you could ask. That's a, a potential yeah. factor there. But I would much rather see Roglic and Vingegaard both at a Grand Tour together at the Tour de France, because first of all, it's a much more important Grand Tour than the Giro and the Vuelta, even arguably combined, in my personal opinion. And next to that... There's the factor of like, yeah, you can say you can win every single Grand Tour, but then you're basically trying to do what, kind of what UAE did this year, right? Yeah. They've got Almeida at the Giro, they've got Pogacar at the Tour de France, they've got both Pogacar now not going to the Vuelta, but planned for the Vuelta, and Almeida planned for the Vuelta still. Almeida's getting two Grand Tour leaderships like the man's know, getting the full crazy. match it's Jackpot. crazy it's like rev- it's like reverse sky it's like the opposite of like yeah i mean i, I mean I, that's just the way it's worked out i think the vuelta that wasn't the plan but pigacha had like he crashed in the tour and etc but i agree that a normal tdf parkour a 12 kilometer they're kind of like this vuelta parkour sierra nevada accepted a 12 kilometer seven percent climb after a medium difficulty stage, Jonas is not dropping Pagacha yeah. one Pogaccia on one. Wins. Like Pagacha gonna win the sprint. It's gonna be like Orsia Millet style stages. Pagacha winning that sprint. Lovely bonus. Thanks very much. 
not going to have an issue in crosswinds or sprint stages or whatever. TT, I'd still say Pogaccio maybe a bit better. Rainy day has a, you know, he does his normal level, everyone else a bit worse. All of a sudden, you're trying to take back a minute on Pogaccio on uh, two back to back 10K, 7% climbs. You're not. Like, you're just not. So, without two leaders. So, if if the parkour next year is a little bit less difficult in the Alps and Pyrenees, you have to have two leaders. Otherwise, it's impossible to beat Pagacha unless I don't know, unless Jonas TT is stays much better than him, which is not a guarantee either. So, yeah, I think I think he has to. You, the, especially if UAE Benji have bring a better team as well and you can't have wow up the road in every stage and all the satellite riders as well. But what do you expect from Vingegaard? Sorry, I'll let you say what you wanted to say in a second, but what do you expect? Is Vingegaard going to now win Paranese next year, win Dauphiné? And do, should we expect him now to just be cleaning up every World Tour one week he does as well? I'll be honest, I've got no clue because he's got so many injuries, injuries in, in one week race in the last two years. Like, Last year, the Dauphiné had his Achilles injury. Yeah. Then during the Ardennes, he was not doing too great when it comes to his fitness, is what it seemed to me at least. He was injured at some point this year as well. Did he have COVID or what was that? Early on I in the season? I think he had COVID at an unfortunate time. Okay. And then at Basque Country, he was the better one compared to Roglic, but Roglic had his knee thing. I don't know. They both had stuff all, all throughout the year, like Roglic and Vingegaard. Yeah. And it's like at the Tour de France, they were they seemed to be finally okay until Roglic had his issue. This Tour de France should be a a symptom that Vingegaard can do this in other races as well. But the question is, will he be the type of rider that is able to do this throughout the entire year, like a Roglic and a Pogacar could, or will he be the kind of Grand Tour rider like a Froome or a Nibli and so forth who? specifically needs to peak for Grand Tours because throughout the year, if he does that, then he might not be at his best at a Grand Tour. We don't know that, right? Yeah, like he, Dauphiné, he was good, could have won, but Roglic won. Like he only got beaten by his teammate, which is kind of like a half victory, I guess. Um, <laughs> but you're right, like Torreno on Carpeña, I guess it could be weather as well. Like, is he going to be as good in cool wet conditions in the spring one weeks compared to Pagacha who that is like where he's best yeah I think I think it's more will he be impacted more than Pogacha will because Pogacha is the the rider in GC that is the least impacted in those conditions and when it comes to Vingegaard yeah his Tour de France stage eight last year it's still a year ago he was not the Vingegaard that we have now of course so that difference is not there really but is that an a uh, something that shows that he's also a bit weaker in those conditions like Roglic is for example or like when it comes to Roglic we say that but he's got some decent rainy victories already is it more that he can't handle cold. is it the cold or is it like the sudden things that happen like for example on Formigal he had the jacket issue he had the crash in Paranese for example like is it something happening and not responding to that well during the stage well, yeah, because like Coyarri, your man, uh, um, Kovadonga combo was rainy, but it it was summer jersey time in the well okay. to last year. Um, and he did incredible performance, like career performance there, following Bernal then dropping him. I think maybe it, it's not even, and this is something I've been talking to writers about as well, um, change in temperatures, rapid change in temperatures. And I think this caught a lot of riders off guard at Tour de Suisse and we'll see less of it at the Vuelta. A lot of guys before Tour de Suisse doing altitude, doing training in temperate weather, in 20 degrees, 15 degrees, starting their ride in the morning. If you start their ride in the morning in Andorra up at the altitude back in May or June, it's, it's like single digits up there in the morning when you when you roll down the hill. And they go to Swiss, bang, it's yep. 35 degrees. And the body just shocked. Um, I think that's also something that maybe some riders deal with better than others. And it's something that is probably you know not well understood. And in horse racing, you have the concept of, it's very well known, of wet trackers. Horses that do much better in wet conditions yeah. or do the same in wet conditions. It's like something, the minute the rain weather forecast changes the odds will change significantly like it's it's modeled whereas in cycling 
for sure it has a huge impact, but is it well yeah. understood? I'm not sure. We obviously very strongly believe that Pagacha is almost unimpacted Unbeatable. by shit conditions. Unbeatable. Yeah. <laughs> in, in shit conditions, he's unbeatable. In shit conditions, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, the handling and everything, unbeatable. And then same with almost Vanderpool. Anyway. I don't know what that topic was, um, but <laughs> this is the problem. We write down the agenda and topics. And Vingard, Vingard, yeah. Um, <laughs> I agree with you. It looks more like a Froome, Nibali style Benji. So maybe don't expect him to just be cleaning up Paranese. Maybe he will with good prep. I don't know. Um, anyway, the last question on the men's tour of France that we had was the KOM classification. We had the anti pagacha system. It turned into Jonas Vingard winning. I think the system is fine. I think the points allocation of KOM was fine. There was no double points. There was stages that Mejev, Morgin, I think it, that was all fine except for the parkour. It was maybe the hardest I've ever seen for a skinny climber to get in a breakaway in this year's Tour de France. There were no early climbs in a lot of the big mountain stages and for guys like Mike Woods or Pino, they just can't do it. They're just like Mike Woods in particular really, really struggled from what I could see to get in the break and the flat, fast starts. You seen that really wide handlebars. He didn't have a tug buddy on certain of them. And it makes it really hard for them to get in the break. Whereas Geshka is actually really good. And that's where I think he was doing well. And so I think that was the problem, Benji. And they need to put just a little 3K, 8% of Lasset de Montvernier early just to so those guys can get in the break. Yeah, I think this year will be a difficult year to judge the KOM jersey as a consequence of that. Like last year, we had the double points on the final climb that impacted it so hard that Pogaccia ended up winning the KOM jersey versus the others like about pools and so forth. This year, we didn't have those double points on the final climb, but the impact of the breakaway formation, like you are mentioning, caused it to be so difficult to be in the breakaway that riders were so inconsistent at getting in the breakaway in the first place on the stage that mattered for the KOM points. And therefore, they weren't getting the high points that they needed to combat the limited amount of points that a Vingar Pogacar could get on the final climbs of stage. Now, I also think next to that, the added bonus of the breakaway formation is that it became so incredibly hard for a breakaway to form that it basically became possible for GC riders to take home the mountain stage that were breakaway stage in the first place. Yes. So that well, added and, and another... Not that, yeah? to, to, to take maximum points on not the last climb, on the yeah. Galibier, on that's the big problem too. I think all those... I think the entire breakaway formation is the reason that the KOM jersey was this year won by Vingega and not by a KOM breakaway artist for example and i think therefore it's very difficult to judge the kom classification solely on this year i think we need to test the same system as we had this year again on a different parkour next year before we can actually judge it because i think on the majority of races the majority of tour de france is with this system you're gonna have a breakaway rider taking the kom jersey at the end of the year at the end of the tour de france is my guess but there's some people they that should were have. yeah well they okay. barely did even yeah. even with no one except Geshka really going for it properly. Vingegaard barely won. So, like, the system, I think, was fine. I think so as well. I think the system's fine. I think they need to keep it for next year, test it out another year. But there's some people that are offering up ideas like, should there be a KOM jersey based on the KOM times, the times of which a rider does on a climb? But my opposing thought to that is, what if I'm a guy that is like in the peloton? I'm like, oh, I want the points on that climb. Let me wait for the Gruppetto for a bit before the climb starts and then start racing up the climb from the Gruppetto. Like, <laughs> what are we doing here? Like, it would I don't result like in it. so much shithousery. <laughs> it would be so, it would, it would, it sounds like, oh, it makes sense. But in, rea in reality, I think it would be so bad. <laughs> like, how will you visualize yeah. it? Like, will you follow the people that are actually going faster throughout the climb? That you wouldn't be able to have a moto on them for like most yeah. of the time. It, it doesn't, it wouldn't work. Um, it's fine. It's just, it's just the way it worked out. And whereas double points, yeah, that had to go. Uh, that just had to go. But uh, we'll, we'll try and wrap up the men's TDF now. We'll do a little keep Wait. style. Alisa? One more question. Was One this more. the best Tour de France you ever watched? I'm 12, so I haven't watched many. But yeah, it was 
It was. It was. And that was because GC was just every day. I swear there was something on GC, even on the stages like Morgin and Majev. Like I had them booked in, swift ride, late lunch, maybe even go out to lunch with my wife. Nah. It was like UAE pacing, big fight for the break. It was like, I can't wait for the well to where I see. I just can't wait for Burgos, uh, Keeper, Kern Farmer <laughs> to get in the break. Two guys off flat station. I'm like, yes, fuck yes, yes. They <laughs> come back in three hours. We never had that. Even while going solo on stage, like, you had to still watch. So, yeah, it was incredible. Like, I remember so many of the stages were memorable. Grenon was a crazy stage. Out the Wes. That was the only kind of stalemate one. But then even the Pyrenees, like Pagatcha just went all in for the win and just made it super entertaining. Uh, UAE on Perigude, even even the Fla State, even the uh, Murder Pagua State 16, Benji, nothing happened in the end. But the tension before there, it could have exploded. One bit of weakness from Vingegaard or, or Pagatcha, they got satellite riders and suddenly big time. Like the tension was really, really good. Whereas... It's kind of like the opposite to the Giro where no big gaps are happening, no big gaps are happening, not too much, three guys together, 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 final climb, Healy goes, takes time, to, uh, Giro's over. Like, it, it, you know, there wasn't actually the tension. Like, remember during that final Giro stage, it was like, this is shit, and it was boring. And then he just watched the test done. This tour was kind of opposite with wall to wall action so my answer is yes sorry that was a very long way of saying yes good i like the answer i think when it comes to me i was kind of like when the tour de france started i was like okay these first three danish stages the public's amazing we had a first time trial with the weather kind of deciding the victor a bit which i'm never a fan of when it comes to time trials so I was kind of a bit like meh about it, even though it's Lampard, awesome guy, really happy that he won. His interview was amazing, really honest and so forth. So I love that. But the first eight stage of the last year's Grand Tour are a perfect Grand Tour in itself for me. But then it became boring because it was so obvious that Pogaccio was winning after the first eight stages last year. But the first three stages of last year's Grand Tour were more memorable to me than the first three of this year's Grand Tour. Van der Poel with Mur de Bretagne, the yellow oh, jersey yeah. for Pulidor, Alaphilippe on the first stage in World Championships jersey. Like, that's awesome to me, those first three stages. These three first stages in Denmark were a bit meh, in my personal opinion. They were. But then it started tuning up. It started tuning up. We had three Wout van Aert second place in those first three stages, and having him do that crazy stuff on that Calais finish... Like, that was pretty amazing to watch. Let's be honest about it. That kind of kicked off the Tour de France for me. And that's when it started coming stage by stage by stage by stage. Just continuously action, 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 action. And I think in the end, it is the most crazy Tour de France I've watched. Because even on the flat stages, Pogaccio was attacking into the breakaway sometimes. And that's something you wouldn't see in the Froome days. Bardet was not doing that against Froome in 20. 17 as my guess 2016 whatever the year they had Peragut as well where Bardet won like we we seen so much action throughout this Grand Tour on stage that we didn't expect it either I'd say this is probably the best Grand Tour I've ever watched although there's probably some recency bias in there I'm a, a person that is often biased to recent events if a, a rider wins the most recent race I will probably rate them higher than someone who won that exact race a year ago yeah, but, Remco's winning the Vuelta because he won San Sebastian. <laughs> I told you this already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's my point. <laughs> no, nah, like, is that... It's the best one we've ever done since starting the podcast. Yeah. Well, is it? No, because tw- no, 2020 was not the best overall race. It maybe had the most crazy finish. Yeah. And it, but, but I don't think best overall race. I did mention once on the podcast, the finish of a Grand Tour is very vital to how I rate them in my rankings when it comes to the years. 2016 Giro was dog shit for me because I'm an Ibali fan. The dude's losing 17 decades on a time trial and a mountain time trial against Stevie Squareway. So that's pretty damn sad. And in the end, in the last week, it all turns around. Yes, I'm a hardcore Nibali fan, so I'm very happy that the events unfolded like they did. It's very unfortunate for Steven, of course, for Steven Kreisweg on that and Esteban. ice wall. Esteban, well, yeah, I never really Mikey saw him Shane as... Nah, nah, Vincenzo Nibali, goat, absolute goat. But, but I don't, were you, did you not 
could you have not watched the TT this year? I still had to watch it, you know, because of because of 2020. I can't. I know mathematically, I was like, Pagacha cannot do anything, and after out of game, he couldn't. But I still was like, I still got to watch this TT. Ah, <laughs> I don't know I, what's going to happen. I didn't believe Pagacha was going to win after Paragud. Paragud was like, because like even in the worst possible scenario where. Vingegaard was so isolated that UAE was at their strongest. It was Vingegaard able to follow Pogacar and even contest for the stage when in Peragut, for example. And when you're that strong that you can take that competition on at your weakest team-wise, then I was not scared of what's about to come in the coming uh, few days, except for a crash or puncture. But hey, what? there's nothing we can do about that. There, That happens. So I, I well, never tried can. to think you about that. You cannot follow not follow Pagacha doing Threat of Death down Spandels <laughs> and you can not try and break the descent KOM into Rocamador and the TT. So I disagree. There are a few <laughs> things. So that's why I had to watch because Jonas was like, I want to win by five minutes, it looked like to me. Um, I made it entertaining. But, yeah, it was the best one. I think we've definitely covered on the podcast, one of the best I've ever watched and just very aggressive racing. I think that was Yumbo team being aggressive and then oh, gotcha. you're coming up against a one-man a one-man wrecking ball. Oh, that's unfair, actually. So, um, McNulty and Bjerg made stage 17, um, yeah. but otherwise he was, you know, always attacking. So, yeah, crazy race. How would you – Ineos, Benji, just quickly. <laughs> Ineos, Ineos might have been in the background this Tour de France. They certainly were not the strongest team. Like, I remember after the uh, – after Roglic abandoned – People said Ineos are now the strongest team. And I was like, on paper, of course, but look at Van Baal. Look at Castroviejo. Look at Ghana. These guys are getting dropped on first climb of the day. They're not able to get in the break easily. I, I don't know what happened, whether they're overraced, whether they're just sick, whether you, you – know, I don't know. The That being said, the team wasn't that exciting. They won teams. Thomas podiumed. Pidcock won on Alpe d'Huez. That is a successful tour. I think if you say to them before the race, you're going to have all those things, a stage win, uh, an iconic one with your big young star you gave a big contract to, British, and Thomas Podium and teams, that's a successful tour. But it almost didn't feel like that because they couldn't impact the race yeah. in any way. It was just Thomas following. But that was the best strategy for him. I agree with that. It's the best strategy for Thomas, and that's why it worked out in the end getting that podium. He was also simply the third best climber in this race, in my opinion, throughout this entire uh, race. Now, the yep. time trials, did help him compared to other riders. That's also an extra, but climbing-wise, he was there as well. So, in general, I think Ineos did well using that strategy. It's less entertaining that they didn't go in breakaway with Pickock sometimes to put pressure on other teams, but perhaps it's because Thomas wants a, a more relaxed race where UAE and Yumbo are not facing down the breakaway the entire day, for example. Like, they might listen to him and, like, say... Uh, what what do you what race do you want, for example? But I'd argue one of the biggest disappointing riders of this Grand Tour is Filippo Ganna. He didn't do it in the time trials. Nope. He was basically a bottle carrier for Ineos throughout the races. He was on quite a fair with the GC group, which I still can't wrap my head around. But oh, it's quite like, a fair was soft pace oh, with okay. Laporte before oh, okay. Van yeah. But like. I feel like he's been disappointing this Grand Tour. I hope he beats the one-hour record. I think he should do that easily still. But I feel like it's a bit of a disappointment uh, for Ineos that Gana was not at the level that he was probably hoping to be. And Martinez, I think, came into the race either unwell or with adjusted prayer piece. He got slowly better throughout the race. He did his best uh, in the back end. But, yeah, it was it was crazy because Thomas did this pretty much on his own in the mountains, like no team support. I know Yates paced him a little bit on Pagur, but Thomas beat David Guru by six minutes in fourth. Like you take away the top two, Thomas spanked everyone else with barely any <laughs> team support in the mountains. So like yeah. a crazy performance from him. What about Adam Yates though? Like do Ineos... I don't really see why Ineos need an Adam Yates. Like, why would you yeah. be giving Adam Yates one week World Tour race leadership next year you instead or? of a instead of a Carlos Rodriguez, a Plap, a Hater, the young guys who maybe will Pidcock even become that next GT guy? 
Agreed. I would not re-sign Adam Yates if I was Ineos. It's as simple as that. He's not worth it when it comes to Grand Tours. He did get a um, fourth spot. No, he did. Did he get fourth spot? Yes, right? Yes. Uh, last fourth year in the, in the world to last year. Yeah, he not a podium. He didn't keep pacing when Haig was behind. Exactly. He can podium a Grand Tour if he's tactically perfect. But um, I think I wouldn't re-sign him. You've got plenty of youngsters that might be able to do so in the future. So... I'd say nope. I'd focus that money on trying to keep Carlos Rodriguez. I uh, heard a rumor that he might be staying, so let's hope that's the case. And uh, if that's the case, then uh, we might see that Spanish jersey uh, on the podium of the Vuelta this year. Yeah, I'm going to keep on saying it. It's happening. Last year, I <laughs> tweeted it in July that he would podium the Vuelta of 2023. Is I'm stronger taking than that him. goal. Fuck that. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Carlos Sivakov Rodriguez. I don't want to hear it. Carlos Rodriguez right. is going to podium the 2022 Vuelta. We need to have a Christian Rodriguez versus Carlos Rodriguez head to head um, <laughs> at the Vuelta. Actually, wasn't there issues with Christian yeah. at Total? Yeah, um, they they snubbed him because of for the tour. Yeah, he was going to uh, Arkea, I think, and Fuck, he, he apparently it's rumored because of his transfer that he wasn't signed up to the Tour de France. So similar to Quinton yeah. Hermans, that's a shame, and I don't like it. I hate that stuff. Yeah. Um. Anyway, Ineos, I would say. It was good for what they had before the tour, but overall, lot big picture, is this what Jim Ratcliffe is paying the most, the biggest budget in the sport for, or the equal with UAE or around there? Is this what he's paying it for, or is it to win the tour? I think it's to win the tour, and at no point, at no point were they really capable of winning the tour, or even but- close. I'm going to throw in another question while we're doing a 10-hour podcast anyway. When it comes to the riders at Ineos right now, we saw Tom Pitcock win on Alpe d'Huez. We saw him get a That's top 10 That's the most important thing of this whole tour. Did he get a top 10 in GC in the end? Uh, he, no, nah, no, nah, he hard cracked third week. He oh, lost okay. like an hour. I was just about to ask you if you ever see him podiuming a Grand Tour, but... Oh, no, of course. Okay. Tell me. No, no. It, it, for the young guys, like it, it doesn't matter that they couldn't do the full three weeks. It doesn't matter. What matters is, could they stay in top ten close for like the first ten days? Avonpol did in the Giro when he shouldn't have gone. Peacock did it in this Tour de France, a hard tour too. Can do they have the pure climbing after a hard stage in hot conditions to compete against Vingegaard and Pagacha? Don't know about Pidcock, but Alpdewez was a very, very good performance. I think he did 5.8 on Alpdewez after being in the break, after bridging solo. He also has probably top five technical skills. Like, he's a, a god. Like, the descending, that is, yeah. when your descending is that good, it's it's not just not a negative, it's a huge advantage. And so I think for them, the most important long term is that Pidcock did so well in the first 10 or so days, won the stage, or 13 days even, and hopefully, if I was them, I'd be hoping he's caught the bug. I'd be hoping he's caught the Tour de France bug, and he's like, okay, I'm going to... Because you need to sacrifice a lot to prepare for GC yeah. on the Tour, you, you, and that's what they're probably hoping for, or maybe he wants to do other things. I don't know. But if he prepares fully for Grand Tours for the Tour, he can podium the Tour de France in the next three, four years. And for that, we need to f- configure also in the Olympics, for example. I think 2024 True, is Paris. Paris, so likely he won't be doing the tour in 2024 considering the Olympics are near that period, most likely. So they I'd are. cancel that out. 2023 might be early to podium a Grand Tour. 2025 is the year, perhaps, that he can try that quest. I think uh, I agree with the factor that he needs to be decisive about what he will focus on because it's physiologically different to be a classics rider than a climber, although Pogacar has shown to be able to do both, for example. Pitcock probably as well can do both quite well. So I don't know. Would you rather see him win RVVR podium a Grand Tour? Uh, I'm very stage race focused. I'd love to see him fully try and test his limits in Grand Tours. I think... I'm not so concerned about the pure climbing. I think if you're his size and you can put guys under pressure on the flat, then you the Watts per kilo will sort themselves out. Even if Paul's proved this and Peacock, I think, will prove that. It's more, can he do the volume? 
the Richie Port hours to be able to do the three weeks, recover, etc. Because he he couldn't recover at the back end of this tour, but I don't think he's he's not tested it yet. So I, I really want to see that from Pidcock. And I'm I was excited. Alptewer's crazy, like. He, yeah, he ruined Menkes, man. Menkes didn't expect him to be able to do that. Menkes was trying to bait him. Pico was like, actually, I'm just going to keep running away from you. So, yeah, Ineos positives, but also maybe Ratcliffe's like, where are we winning the tour? <laughs> Who's winning the tour in the next three <laughs> years? Um, maybe there's that as well. I don't know. Um, Bernal crashing, they couldn't control. But that's all from us. That was our mega Tour de France uh both races recap thanks to for listening thanks to zwift as always for supporting the show let us know what you think about all the topics we spoke about um bit of a different style today i think it was a lot better uh but feedback is as always appreciated and yeah thanks for all your support for the month it's been a grueling month from us we're very very tired we'll be taking a week off polonia will have a recap uh overall recap not daily recaps benji's going i don't know where he's going actually i'm going to San Sebastian next week and brussels it's a fairy tale trip. fucking city. How could you not like it? Swans on the lake. Ben, you won't get that reference. All right, that's it. Oh, you I, have watched the movie finally. I actually saw it in the past, but I didn't get the reference last time you made it. Now I do. Yeah, I mean, my accents are there on point, I guess. Ray Fine's great performance. All right, this is Descended. We're off. Bye.